this uh, presentation is a kind of a pre-concert teaser uh, for those of you who live in the Tucson area. Uh, we'll be hosting Steve and Ty on Saturday, February 25th at 2.30 p.m. at our Central Tucson campus. And we do have uh, only about 18 tickets left on the show uh, at this point for our afternoon show. Um, if any of our members or participants in um, Zoom live in the Green Valley area, there's a separate concert down there at the Community Performing and Art Arts Center, CPAC, on Thursday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. The interesting thing that you'll hear in, later in our talk is that both of these shows will be totally different because uh, the different time of the day will indicate a different uh, type of music for each show. So we'll learn a little bit more about that as we go. And with that, introduce our guest today. Um, welcome, Steve and Ty and S Steve Oda, who joins us from San Rafael today, right? California, I That's believe. Right. That's and, right. And uh, he's a master Sarod, uh, of the Sarod uh, <laughs> instrument and, and a Ty Burho who plays tabla. And I really want the two of you to kind of introduce yourselves because you have amazing backgrounds and uh, you know, we're excited to be hosting you both here again next month. Um, they are returning to Tucson after really being gone during the pandemic. We we were unable to have you, but they generally come here almost every year and perform. And uh, we're very excited to have you back. And we're excited that we get to host you this time at our at our Central Tucson campus. So um, it should be a lot of fun. But today we're focused more on the two of you and uh, learning a bit more about classical Indian music. And so um, if you'd both please just introduce yourselves and take it away. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with my good buddy, Ty Burho. And um, help to give you a little bit of background on this classical Indian classical music that we love so much. We've both been long involved with learning this wonderful art form, very deep and um, uh, varied art form. And um, I, I come from Canada um, by way of Japan and uh, uh, that's another story, but uh, I've, I've been studying Indian classical music since 1970. Um, so that's just over 52 years now, so quite a while. Anyway, uh, I hope I can help uh, give you a brief glimpse into what we both love so much. And um, I'll turn it over to Ty. Thanks, Steve, Son, Steve G. Uh, yeah, I'm Ty Burho, and I'm playing the tabla, the hand drums. I got my little swivel camera here. Um, and I've been studying, uh, I started with uh, Ustad Zakir Hussain in 1990. And, um, and prior to that, I was studying a little accompaniment with a Sarod player, another student of Kansab Ali Akbar Khan. And, um, named David Tresoff, and before that, just for a year or so, I initially learned with a guy named Jeff Johns. Some of you may have heard his name. He was an Afro-Cuban drummer and teacher, and, um, and he played enough tabla to get in trouble, and I was really attracted to it. So I, I started with him, Jeff Johns, and that was like in 88, 1988 maybe. And then... Um, and then through working with David Tresoff, got introduced to Zakir Hussain, and then that was it. And once I met him, I was uh, love at first beat, so to speak. So uh, the journey for me has been basically a hobby gone wild. I, I My degree is in something else, uh, psychology and wildlife biology, but... Uh, but I just, my hobby kept on taking me into more musical situations. And eventually that led me to Steve. <laughs> and uh, our good friend, Michael Lewis, uh, had been talking about Steve. Ty, you've got to go, you know, 
hang out with Steve. He's such a musical player. You'd, you'd love him. You'd get along with him personality-wise, everything. And so at some point, I finally had a gig where I could invite him, and that was out in, where was that, Steve? In Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Um, yeah. East Coast Some historical somewhere. town. Yeah, right? Yeah, a little town outside Philadelphia, I think, or some, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and so, and it was wonderful, you know, and, um, and basically at that point we started and I had a trip to Japan. I invited him to Japan and we, that kind of turned into a whole, um, many, many, many trips to Japan, to Australia, around the U S and, and things. So, um, I'll, I'll throw it back in Steve's direction and we can talk about, you know, anything about our, our journey here. Yeah, it was uh, uh, my blessing, really, to meet Ty and to be involved with his many tours, wonderful, wonderful places we visited, so many different friends we've made um, because of this music, and um, which uh, really, I guess, uh, we should begin now on, on some of the Indian classical music aspects of our of our journey together and mine involves basically this instrument which I'll demonstrate in a bit called the Sarod 25 string fretless lute but before that um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the uh, background of Indian classical music it's uh, as many of you may know a very very ancient musical system a classical system um, developed in India um, way back in the 16th century, perhaps even before that. Um, my teacher, Ali Akbar Khansab, um, would often tell us a story about how uh, musical sounds evolved um, from the two different sounds that we have in the universe struck and unstruck he would talk about the different vibrations that they would emanate both externally and internally and how everything in this whole universe vibrates with this frequency it helps it helped us get a grasp of the importance to him of music and um He wanted us to be uh, thinking of this music as a yoga, as and, and indeed it is one of the aspects of yoga called nad yoga or the so sound of yoga, that um, is so so vital to all of us and to our uh, spiritual building and spiritual growth, and that's what really attracted me into this music, and um, why I got involved in it some 52 years ago, trying to uh, pursue this dream of learning how to play the music of India. Um, you want to continue, Ty? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, that's that that also was my attraction. Um, I, I have just a quick story. Um, I was attending Naropa Institute or Naropa University, a Buddhist kind of centered uh, college in Boulder, Colorado. And I was just getting introduced to Indian music through Jeff Johns, a, a world music course. And we had we spent a week or something on Indian music. And um, and he said, oh, you should go to the, the LP section of the library and take out, they have some nice LPs of classical Indian music. So Naropa had a what you could consider a phone booth size sitting room. You open the door, go in, there's a chair, <coughs> a mini shelf with a, a, uh, a record player on it, and then some headphones. So you could pick out whatever you wanted from the library, put on a record, put on your headphones and disappear into the music. And I would put on, uh, there's a some beautiful recordings like Shri, for example, it's just called Shri. It was a black LP and um, uh, Ustad Ali Khan was playing this. And I would put this on and 
<coughs> completely dissolve into the music. And that experience of putting on a record of Indian music, not knowing anything about it, but putting it on, the first thing that comes on is this, the drone. And it felt like, ah, something is alive, something's here. And then the way that they would build the rag, and then to the point where the tabla came in, and it became with two people, this magnificent orchestra. Mm -hmm. And then it would, it would, you know, they'd come to an ending, and then still there's that drone happening at the end. So it's kind of, it, it gave me a sense of um, a lifespan of even a, a human. You know, there's, there's life kind of pure and something begins to build. And there's a journey, every time is unique. And then it comes to an end and still at the end, there's that continuation of some kind of existence or vibration. And for me, immediately I saw that connection to a spiritual kind of lens that the music would allow me to have. And I fell in love at that point. Um, and then I started learning about what's involved in Indian music and started taking tabla lessons and such. Mm -hmm. And I guess that leads us to uh, our, our topics of today, namely mm -hmm. Raga and Tala. Um, and I will, I will begin with uh, discussing a little bit about Raga. Pardon me while I share the screen. And you should be seeing now on your screen the Oxford Dictionary definition of Raga, a pattern of notes having characteristic intervals, rhythms, and embellishments used as a basis for improvisation. Raga. Um, and I, this, this really kind of sums up the whole of Indian classical music um, in a nutshell. Um, we have a similar number of notes as, as, as we do in the West. We have 12 tones, as you can see on this uh, slide, um, beginning with Sa or Do, and then going up the scale Sa, Re, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do, for example. And so you hear, you, you see here, two different ver versions of Re, a Como Re, which is a flatted uh, uh, note, and the shudder ray, which is the natural note. Similarly so, with ga, yes. Uh, we don't. I don't think we see that slide that you're referring to. Oh, it's still on the raga definition. Oh, hmm. Uh, uh, not sure how to get back. Maybe I have to try stop, again. Yeah, if we stop sharing and, and then reshare. Reshare. Mm -hmm. then... Yeah, the sharing is very specific, isn't it? <laughs> How's that? Ah, there we go. Got it. Is that better? Okay, Great. sorry about that. So as I was saying, we have one saw, we have two rays, we have two ga, two ma, one pa, two da's, and two knees. So altogether we have 12 tones, just like in Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, in, in the Western scale, we have Sa, Re, Ga, Ma, Pa, Da, Ni, Sa, in the Indian scale. And there's the Western equivalent on the far right, from C up to high B. And for the sake of, uh, of, our, of our learning this very vast raga system, some, something in the order of 75,000 ragas in, I don't know, a couple hundred different talas, Thai. 
something like that, uh, some huge number. Um, they decided to organize the scales into category, uh, into what they call tots, the ten tots. And um, if I just may show you briefly with this, hope you can see this. So starting with Kalyan scale. And then progressing on down, the Lavel scale is simply the major scale. And similarly, we have the other classifications or tots to which ragas are derived, including including some of some strange scales, such as the one called toady. Not exactly familiar to most Western ears, but uh, but uh, a beautiful scale nonetheless, and and one called Purvi. Um, also in this same handout are some raga rules that uh, help define what a raga is. And um, uh, as I was mentioning before, every every raga has a has a scale, and in this case, uh, of at least five notes. Every raga has a sa or a do in Western terminology. And every raga has a pa and or one of the ma's, which is the fourth, the fifth and the fourth. Um, other important parts of the raga are that in order to help us learn the feeling and the emphasis of each note within the raga, we go to things called vadi and samvadi. That's king note and the prime minister note that are used throughout the exposition of a raga. I should, I should um, mention that the raga is mostly improvised, about 85%, 80%, 90% improvised. So only the theme remains fixed and then we we help to interpret and develop the raga from the basic elements of the scale. Um, every raga has a heart, uh, which is a phrase that's used within the raga repeatedly to help us understand that it is that raga that we're listening to. Every raga has a road map uh, how to get from Tucson to Phoenix, for example. There may be different ways of going. Uh, there's a good way, there's a fast way, but there's also a scenic way that you want to take, and they're called chelan. So every raga has a chelan. Um, every raga has feelings. Um, uh, for example, Now this raga, which comes from this coffee scale or the Dorian mode, is called Bimpalasri. We use 
ornaments in the scale to help us express the feelings of the raga. One of the, one of the most fascinating and beautiful aspects of Indian classical music is the feeling and the ornaments or the, what they call the microtones. Uh, in addition to 12 tones in the Indian, in the Western scale, we have 10 additional um, microtones that are used in a very judicious way to help bring out the mood of the raga. As, as Scott alluded to, uh, when we play um, our two programs in uh, Tucson in Arizona, um, we'll be playing them at different times of the day. And, and as such, we will choose ragas in particular for those times of the day, as ragas are assigned to be um, played um, at particular times of the day or even in different seasons. There, there are rainy season ragas, there are winter ragas, there are springtime ragas. So we'll see what we can come up with um, for, this, for these concerts. Now, every raga has a way to go up the scale and a way to come down the scale. So in the, in the case of Bimpalastri that I just tried to illustrate, the scale going up would be So that's that's a little tiny little primer <laughs> on Indian classical music. I, ho I hope it um, uh, elicits some comment and some questions perhaps for later on. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to try to answer them if I can. That'd be great. I'll just briefly show you, if I may. Um, it's kind of a little large to be fitting in the whole screen. But this is a serode. It's made from one piece, one piece of wood that's been seasoned for many decades and hollowed out inside. Covering one end of the serode is a fretless fingerboard. In this case, it's chrome-plated steel. And on the sound box, we have a very thin goat skin covering. Kind of like a banjo in a way, but it's enclosed. We have 25 metal strings that go across, as you can kind of see, um, the, the, the whole width of the neck. We have four main playing strings. These here. Six sympathetic or rhythm strings and 15 little resonating strings that are tuned differently for each different raga so that they can resonate and help sustain the sound. I use a coconut shell plectrum to pluck the individual strings, 10 of which sit on top of this bone bridge that it itself sits on top of this 
goatskin sound box. I use my left hand to kind of fret the notes on the fingerboard. So if I was to play it like a guitar, <clears throat> it would sound a little muffled if I use my fingernail I can get a much finer, more resonant sound from the instrument. That's it. <laughs> oh, one last thing. This bell on the end uh, is a, a sound box of sort but it's also a, a weight, a counterweight, so that it can sit more comfortably in the lap. Nice. Thank you, Steve. Son. Sir. Sir. Over to Mr. Burho. Yeah, let's talk about tal, tala a little bit. And tala meaning rhythm, actually it comes from the, uh, the word clap for clapping and clapping more than one clap sets up a length between the claps a third clap lets you know <laughs> basically what tempo you're at and um, so tall meaning to clap referring to rhythm and um, and I'll start the way Steve ended here which is just to show you the drums and give you a sense of you know what they're made from first off so there's a, a low drum and a high drum. And the low drum, traditionally, before touring and airplanes and all that stuff, a lot of the, the drums, when they would stay put in the villages, were made of clay. And you can, still can find clay bayas. Baya meaning left. I'm a lefty, so my baya is on my right. But, um, but they're fragile in that way. They, they would break, of course, if you put them on an airplane. And then you also would find wooden shells. Uh, however, again, as soon as you change humidity, going to a different place that's very dry, for example, all of a sudden you'd find the, the drum cracking, right? So there's issues with those materials. And so eventually they came up with the metal. And a good bass drum is a mixture of maybe seven different metals mixed together uh, like a really nice cooking pot. And, you know, if you hit the bottom of a nice cooking pot, it's actually quite uh, usually a beautiful sound, resonant tone. And it's the same with a good baya. It's a nicely blended metal. And, um, and then around that, we've got woven these water buffalo straps. The pegs aren't necessarily there in the beginning. As, the, as things stretch out, you need to put pegs in and, and you can adjust the tuning. But you can get the baya, the bass drum, all tuned up without the pegs and add those later. And then on top, and it's the same for both drums, but on top you've got uh, basically the same kind of skin that's on the sarod, a goat skin. And... Um, there's a, a floating layer of leather called the sur or madan, and then you've got an edge, a protective extra layer of leather around the edge, and another word for, well, the Hindi word for edge is kinar, referring to bank or the edge of something. And um, these are, if you only have those elements on either drum, it sounds basically like a bongo. Pop, 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 kind of a short, you know, pop kind of a sound. And this black dot is kind of the secret magician's trick. And if you, what they used to do a long time ago was just put like chapati or, you know, dough, um, a bread dough 
of a specific you know mixture and they would if you put that a, a small layer of that onto this high pitched head pretty tense head it adds weight to the head and then when you hit it the weight pulls it lower and higher than it would normally go in terms of vibration it's moving further because of the weight and you add more weight and it moves further and slows down so the more of the black paste that's on a head the lower the pitch becomes and you can scrape some off and the pitch you'll notice will go higher so what that means is that they could take a, a head like these thin goat skins and actually tune it to a specific note it's a, an ama amazing science really and they've gotten it to the point where like on this drum it's usually right now uh it's not tuned to where steve's drone is at but um it is tuned to a specific note so what i'm getting out of this is an overtone or a fundamental tone and you notice it's nice and ringy it has sustain to it and that's all because of this black siahi paste that's put on there it's basically rice flour uh, mixed with fairy dust and um, iron filings and <laughs> magical love and things like that that make it um, you know the, the 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 best makers have the greatest secret in terms of how they create this black paste and and you really notice a difference on the really nice drum the sustain and the tuning is is really wonderful so that's part of what they're made from the other part that it's not you know this is still made out of wood like this used to be sometimes and shishum or uh, rosewood different types of woods and it's closed there's no hole for those drummers out there there's no hole that goes through like on a snare drum to help the compressed air leave the drum you actually want that seal around the whole drum if there was a crack or a hole in the side of this drum it would change the resonance of the head so uh, we want that seal and it's probably an inch thick and then maybe six inches drilled out or or chiseled out in the center of this so it's fairly hefty instrument um but you know not crazy maybe uh five six pounds something like that so then what we have is um an instrument that's very tonal to me when i first learned and i first heard zakir hussein playing i i considered it a melodic instrument not a drum that i had been used to hearing drums um and i, I felt like it was a melody instrument that happened to be incredibly rhythmic and so that's how i think of it still today is i want to bring out as much of the tonality and the uh, melody of the instrument as i can and then of course a lot of the the hits on the drum are very percussive and yet you've got these beautiful tones and so that language it's turned into you know not just three or four different strokes hits and like basics basic hit tones you've got up to you know depends on who you talk to but 15 to maybe 22 different syllables that are separate and you can piece those together uh, vocally you can say, like if i say na what i would play is an overtone stroke very specific and then you get that overtone note so that's a na slight variation on that, on that would be ta if i release that ring finger open it up and hit it you have an open note called tune sometimes tin you have uh, slaps t te tete single finger slaps the ring finger can also hit and you've got full hand hits right and then you've got over here a slap different types of slaps you can slap with different fingers in different locations you got to be careful with that because you're hearing some of the low end you've got all sorts of snaps over here that indicate a cut 
and and the the cut a K with an E or a K and an I or a K and an A, all those indicate a slap on the bass drum, and then you have G, G or G, and that indicates a resonant tone on the bass drum. So you've got that many syllables separated, but then you've got the combinations. So if I play a na with a gay, there's a new syllable formed called da. And you, same thing with the variant here. Ta, gay, you would say din. This could also be din, it could be dun. You have Tete ka, now you've got combinations. Tete kata gadi gene da. Tete kata gadi gene da. And so you start learning phrases. Dati da gadina gena. Dati da gadina gena. Dati da gadina gena da. And you just learn to speak the, the phrasing, and then you learn to play the phrasing. And so it, it's, it's interesting. The. Um, the brain is behind it all, of course. Very close to the brain is the tongue, so we want that first. We want to have the tongue seeing the language and speaking and, and, and sharing it with the ears so that your da dati dagena, dati dagena denagena is, is all this beautiful musical loop that's happening up here. And then a further step, a bit further away in the nervous system is the fingies. And so at that point, we want to translate what came to the tongue out the fingers, right? So, you know, when I first was learning and I, I, I didn't take the advice of my, my guru, <laughs> Zakir Hussein, um, I would just play and I didn't spend enough time speaking. And that, you know, I, I thought I was, I was kind of skipping that step so I could spend more time on the the, the the main goal which is playing the tabla and actually I was uh, mistaken it's it, you hit a roadblock if you don't pay attention to the the language and the speaking of it so that's something that I'm, I'm trying to with the people I teach now and also me as a student I'm spending more time speaking so so let's do a little bit of that and um, you know if I was to teach you a, uh, some core phrases, I'd say, learn dati dage dinagena, right? So dati dage dinagena, dati dage dinagena. And if I said dati dage dinagena, it's different than dati dage dinagena, because there's a, a raise in my pitch, dati dage dinagena, right? So I would know because of my voice that I need to play I've got a high note here. And depending on the speakers on your computer, you may or may not be able to hear that modulation on the bass drum, but it's it's very beautiful if you can hear that. It's very evocative and expressive. And it's one of the qualities of this drum that's, um, it's like water, people say, you know? and. It's also very much like a voice. If I talk like this all the time, how are you today? You know, I'm going to sound like a robot. But if I ask you, how was your day today? I've got actually a lot of modulation happening to help convey a feeling like Steve was talking about on his instrument. There's, there's a way to treat the, the, the note each note with a little bit of variety and um, pressure and release and that help express our feelings. So to me, the, the tabla has the potential, it, from what I've seen, to be, to me, uh, one of the most expressive percussion instruments on the planet. And it, a lot of it has to do with that language, very sophisticated language. So if I was to say, um, Dati da, dati gena tina gena dati da. Kredin da gena kat, dati gena tina. Kedrigadi, kedrigadi. Kedrigada, tari gada, tari gada, tari gada, tari gada, tari gada, dati da gena, dati da gena. Then, okay, gotta play that. Dati da, dati gena, tina gena, dati. So that's
that's a composition that comes from my Guruji Zakir Hussain. And um, just a, a favorite. And I, I remember teaching my son that when he was like four, my son Sean. And I'd go, Tati Da. And he'd say, Tati Kena. I go, Dinna Gena. Tati Da. Put it in, Dagena Kat. Tati Gena Dinna. You know, and so he was learning tabla language through kind of a game or call and response which is a really beautiful way to get into the, the tradition. Um, so now the, another element of this is there's different talas. So if Steve tells me we're going to play this rug this afternoon at 2.30, right, um, in Tucson, and um, he's feeling like he'd like to play that rug in Rupak tal. He might say that to me, right? Or he might just do it and I have to figure it out. Um, so I would say, okay, I know Rupak Tal. So an, another aspect of the of the tabla playing is that I need to learn the basic rhythm of, you know, the, the, the chances of him using all 108 different talas is almost zero. So <laughs> there's, you know, a collection of four to six different talas that he may usually choose from and i need to know those a 16 beat one called tintal right so if i played tintal for you <laughs> So that's uh, like a four, four. It's almost like a 16 bar blues type of a feel. And it's pretty accessible for our, our, our Western ears. Uh, but like I said, he might say, let's play in seven, you know? And and that's that one might be called Rupak Tal. So if I played in Rupak Tal, gosh. Tin, tin, na. So that's great. I, I can play that. And then over the top of that, Steve, and I'll, I'll let Steve talk about this as well. Steve can feel free as long as I'm clean and clear about my teka, about my, my rhythm. I'm laying down a road for him and he can drive his fancy car or his pickup truck or whatever it is and stop and start and move around do a wheelie, you know, whatever he wants to do on that nice road. Um, so it's my responsibility to make sure it's a safe road to drive on. It's not doing a sudden 90 degree turn or something. And then I need to also have a little bit of expressive material that fits into seven. So if Steve says to me, you know, gives me the eyebrow, Hey, take a turn. You solo, All right? <laughs> Improvise Ty. And then I start sweating, right? <laughs> and so if I'm playing this, I might do, I might choose a, a, a what's called a peshkar a type of composition. Um, so we're playing, and he gives me the eyebrow. So I, I might have memorized a composition that sounds like I'm, I'm really, you know, uh, out on left field, but it comes back and it meets the rhythm. Um, so maybe I'll pass it back to Steve at this point and talk about that kind of back and forth relationship. Yeah, the, the, the whole aspect of us um, playing together in real time is really um, such a wonderful, enjoyable, fun thing for me to do, and I hope for Ty as well, um, so that we can actually, after we've played for long enough together, figure out what we're gonna play and how we're gonna be able to sync together 
and and therefore kind of create a synergy of sound, the sarod and the tabla, that become more like an orchestra, that become more um, uh, varied in, in its complexity. Um, I think I think it, it's it's been quite some time now since we've had a chance to really play together, and this will be uh, for us prob probably the first time in a few years since we've we've done this. But I think because of the strength of the foundation that we both have in our in our musical lives, we should be able to come together and produce something real, real memorable for Arizona and for you all. Um, but as I was mentioning, um, a little bit more about the, about the Sarod and like Ty was saying, how, how you modulate, um, for us, one of the really neat things about the Sarod is that you can slide. In between the notes, and there and thereby create create a, a lot more I, I feel a lot more um, emotional uh, connection with the music. That's really one of the things that attracted me the most about playing Indian classical music was the uh, feeling that it could uh, e evoke when, when, when I listened to this in the beginning. Then I, then I realized, wow, that takes a lot of work to be able to, to develop the, the technique and the chops to be able to create that sound. But um, it's something that um, I love so much about uh, playing this classical music. Hmm. Ah, Scott. If I could chime in uh, just to talk a little bit, it, it's obviously you both have been playing individually um, right now, and uh, that is a limitation of Zoom in that you can't play together uh, unless you're maybe in the same room. <laughs> um, and uh, so, to see the beauty of these two working together, you really have to see them in person um, and communicating back and forth. So just know this just gives you a small taste of, of the much larger picture you'll feel and the vibration you feel in person and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Steve, yeah. Steve, would you talk a little bit too about, I, I think in a previous conversation, you, you talked to me a little bit about how um, uh, this music is not unlike jazz in some ways. Could you could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, as I mentioned in the beginning of of my talk, it was um, the uh, the aspect that a raga is is like a scale with rules, and those rules um, have to be adhered to throughout the exposition. Um, but like in jazz where you have chord changes that you can move between chord changes in Indian classical music, you have phrases, for example, in this, in the one raga that I've been showing, we, it's okay to go between the fifth. Coming down, you can add the, add the sixth. But going up, you would never go. You'd never you'd never go to the sixth going up. So those those kinds of rules are limitations. But then, like in jazz, you know you 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 have uh, chord changes um, that you have to follow to produce the desired effect. In Indian classical music, you have to follow the certain roadmaps that you're given how how a raga should go. Mm -hmm. 
And this raga, we skip the second note altogether in ascent. And the and the sixth. But coming down, we can include all of the notes. So it's it's up to us as musicians to figure out well, does this follow the raga or not? Does this does this meet the criteria that we're given um, to play this raga? Um, that's that's one of the uh, the challenges that we face and why it's so difficult to um, to learn initially, and uh, and yet so rewarding that once you do learn how to do it, um, it 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 becomes really remarkable for um, mm -hmm. for for us to to play. Thank you for that. And Ty, can you talk to us a little bit about? <clears throat> I know you play with a number of different artists, and you take your your tabla uh, in a different forms. Describe how you adapt to different shows and and the different people you play with, and and how it's different than say what when you're playing with Steve. Yeah. Well, my favorite uh, music to play is classical Indian music. Um, and my favorite artist to play with is Steve. <laughs> and that a lot of that has to do with friendship. You know, the, the, because the music uh, is made up, at least at a more advanced level, of a lot of improvisation and trading and exchanging f the feeling of the music. And, and hopefully part of my role is to support something that he has presented. And I may highlight something, respond to it, do a call and response type of uh, thing. But th there's, uh, it's fairly quickly, you can see that it's, it's a relationship happening on the stage. And so there's that. That's one of my favorite things. It, it's a music that at its best is like the most beautiful conversation one could have. And um, and beyond conversation mm -hmm. sharing of one's life. And so the other aspect, though, that makes Indian classical music special is that it makes use of all the tools I've been studying. Like there's uh, for example like I said there's a roadway I need to have a be able to lay down a really nice feeling base for Steve to improvise on top of and you know probably 80 percent of what I'll play at a concert is that so I might as well get pretty good at that and have a, at least a tasty <laughs> nice nice shrubberies on the side or whatever <laughs> make, make a nice road so I, I need to have that but then all the tools that I study are the compositional forms and those things, um, I get to use choice ones of those and they're, they have a place that they're, they're, and they're appreciated in this music. If I pull out a kaida, you know, an, an, an old kaida, a two finger kaida, which is a, a style of com composing in tabla, um, in a jazz situation, no one's going to go, ah, oh. you know, <laughs> it, it, I could do, I could do one phrase of a kaida and then go into a fast rela and then do some rolls and I could mix it up and it, it would be okay. Um, but the demand for developing one idea in Indian music is, is so beautiful. And it, it, like Steve said, it's the limitation. And yet within that limitation is where you get to see someone's depth of study, mm. right? And what are you able to do with three strokes, you know, or something along those mm. lines? Or how many variations can you come up with that are musical, the key, <laughs> uh, with, with this limitation, right? And um, so the classical aspect is a real turn on once you get enough material to start appreciating it and enough, you know, uh, basically experience doing it so you know i try to tell a lot of the students and steve i know says this a lot as soon as you have enough tools 
try and get together with people and start playing because mm -hmm. that relationship and making use of the tools that you're forging in your practice room come alive in relationship. Mm -hmm. So now what Scott said is interesting because I, when I play, you know, let's say flamenco or if I play, you know, um, a fusion music or a, a kirtan or, uh, you know, jazz, right? I played a, a lot of jazz and, um, that's beautiful because I get to not worry about the rules. And, um, but one thing that's, I think, important for tabla players who study classical tabla is, and I remember Zakir telling me this, it's like, when you're playing the fusion music, don't try to do like a quilt, you know, like take a piece of classical and stick it onto there because it'll just be it won't blend what you're trying to do in fusion music is actually interweave the fibers and make a unique blanket rather than just patch work together mm -hmm. so even though there's a place for some composition from classical um what when i you know listen to a, a, a finger style modern uh finger style guitar player and usually what I'm trying to do is, is create a rhythm that matches what they're doing. And it may not come from Indian music. It may be something created unique for that. And the same with soloing. It, 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 can, it all comes from Indian classical study. But the way you arrange it and manipulate it ideally is, is more fresh. Mm. So it's a very interesting topic. How do, how do we not just sound like an Indian classical tuba player playing in a fusion setting, but be a, a fusion integrated current musician who's coming up with something unique for the situation. And that's a, that's a tricky question, but I love it. I, I do. I, I love all. <laughs> so when, uh, we, we've talked a little bit about the two shows and I just want to remind everybody again that we have uh, two shows coming up here uh, in one with us at our central Tucson campus in Tucson on Saturday, uh, February 25th at 2.30 p.m. And actually, I just checked. We, we've sold through several tickets just <laughs> while we were on here, but we have 13 tickets left to that show. And uh, we will put the uh, our website in the in the link for Ollie dot arizona dot edu um, where you can learn more about that the concerts right on our home page but um, they'll also be playing in green valley on thursday february 23rd and i believe that's a 7 p.m show at the community performing arts center in green valley which uh, so we have a number of members that are also from that neck of the woods and again um these will be two distinct, very distinct shows. So if you're so inclined, you could even attend both of them because uh, you will have a very different experience um, based on uh, the time of day and, and the uh, energy and the uh, improvisation and, and all of that yeah, that goes with exactly. it. And um, we will have a very intimate room at our central Tucson campus um, where we'll be uh, having a great um, up close view of, of them playing. And when you do see the interchange and the communication between the two, it, it, it really is magical and uh, in incredibly, incredibly relaxing too. Could both of you talk a little bit about sort of how classical Indian music became more popular, westernized, um, you know, some of the uh, we had somebody in the comments mention that they're a big fan of Ravi Shankar and I'm sh and may have heard, I'm guessing, he, back through the time of the Beatles or before. Um, could you talk a little bit about how sort of the Westerners sort of became more familiar with this form of music? It was through Ravi Shankar that I actually became really interested in learning more about Indian classical music. He came to, to Toronto, where I was born, um, back in the late, late sixties and said, um, I, I, I managed to go up and see him in his room afterwards. And, uh, he invited me in very, uh, gracefully and, and said, what can I do to help you? And I said, I'm really, really 
loving your music. I, I want to learn this instrument called the Sarod. Can you help me? And he said, sure, here, here's my address. I live in Los Angeles. Take my address. Um, write me a letter and I'll see what I can do. And I was uh, working as a, a professional engineer at the time and um, only had a limited amount of time on my vacation each year and was waiting uh, patiently for him to respond to my letter, which he never did. And then finally he said, or rather I said, I'm going to give him a call. He left me his, his uh, address in Los Angeles. I'm going to give him a call on long distance and just see if I can reach him somehow. And uh, I got through to the long distance operator and they said, um, Oh, yes, we have our Shankar living on Dorrington Avenue in Los Angeles. Shall we pass you through? This was many, many, many years ago. And uh, I said, yeah. And, and so the, the phone rang and he answered the phone uh, remarkably. And he said, yeah, sure. I remember you. I remember meeting you up in Toronto. What can I do to, to help you? And I said, well, I didn't hear anything back from my uh, request to you through writing. He said, oh, uh, didn't this person or that person respond to you? I said, no, I'll leave it up to me. Give me your number and I'll see what I can do for you. And I, I thought, nah, he's, you know, he's such a busy megastar these days. But two hours later, he said, it's all been arranged. You can come to Los Angeles. You can stay with my tabla player, who happened to be Zakir Hussein's father, Ustad Alaraka. And you can stay with him because right across the courtyard is your first Saro teacher, Ustad Ashish Khan, Ali Akbar Khan's eldest son. So that's my that's my my story of how I got involved with uh, with Indian classical music way back in um, 1969. Wow, that's amazing. I, I had the pleasure of seeing Ravi Shankar perform at WOMAD. Uh, up in Seattle, actually, um, where Ty is from that area right now. And um, it, I've actually seen him a couple times um, before his passing. But uh, I remember one distinct memory I have is, is somebody, it was out in an outdoor um, park, and uh, somebody had a giant macaw. And, and that macaw sat there and got into the rhythm of the music and was just going like <laughs> this and just amazing i have a somewhere i have a video of this that is just phenomenal but to seeing that interaction and 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 to be able to see him was was certainly magical too oh wonderful yeah and, and ty how about you i know um with your mentor and and the like that you but but how were you most exposed to this or how, how, how did yeah. you? Well, I have, um, I actually had prepared a, a little, um, a few uh, slides, a little bit of a, a, a few photos. <clears throat> and uh, let me just show those to you. So this is me and <laughs> my guru, Zakir Hussain. And, um, on the tour. So, so basically for me, I was, I was, um, about 1994 or five when Alaraka, Zakir's father, the tabla player that Steve is referring to that he stayed with, I, um, I started helping produce the shows for Zakir. And then I started traveling with him around 95. And then from then on, I was every year on many tours, always on the U.S. ones, sometimes the international ones. So I became his tour manager. I would say it's more of a tour assistant because I, I did whatever he needed, uh, including tour stuff. And uh, that went on. Oh, there's a picture of Zakir's father. Mm. Right there with Zakir. And you can see with them playing how emotionally and joyful it is. This is another tour with Dave Holland here and Shankar Mahadevan and lots of different people allowed to come. There's uh, Steve Smith. So lots of different, hundreds and hundreds of different experiences. It's just John McLaughlin, with Shiv Kumar Sharma, and I've got a you know a whole 
a bunch of different. <laughs> There's old Sultan Khan. It's not Sultan Khan. Yeah. This is in India. Um, oh, there's Michael Lewis. Uh, but mm. I, I have a, a particular window into this, into the people and the music because of that experience that my, my teacher allowed me to have. And he invited me in and I was able to help out for 25 years until COVID hit. And then I, I kind of turned and started working on uh, being a, a a proper father <laughs> with my little kids and a proper husband and, and uh, just be around for them. So I stopped touring when the COVID uh, mm. pandemic showed up. But up till then, so many beautiful, amazing experiences with the cream of the crop, you know, and I was with Ravi Shankar. I hosted him for a week in, in a house and of course, Ala Raka and uh, Vilayat Khan, Shiv Kumar Sharma, and I were very, very close. Um, and just what a blessing for me to have those experiences. But, you know, I wasn't necessarily playing tabla all the time. I'm not a great tabla player, but I'm, I'm deeply inside the relationship of the music. And that, not just being a player, but having it influence my life and, and, and valuing those amazing people, seeing what the potential is is um uh has been life-changing for me and now now that i'm home a lot more i'm trying to play more and maybe be able to accompany someone like steve uh, a little bit more a little more better <laughs> thanks well we do have some questions that have come in if you'd like we can start um, addressing some of those um, the what we can do is I, I can unmute you if you if you have a question um, you, you'll be able to unmute um, once I um, say go ahead and talk so our first question came in from Robin uh, and I'm probably going to mispronounce your name Robin I want to say Sokolik um, but you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question if you'd like um, Robin Here hi yeah, um, I, this just was um, a question that I had very early on in the talk um, about uh, Raga and um, uh, Steve Oda, Mr. Oda, Guru Oda, whatever we call, um, said, um, well, there's a, a phrase that's the, the heart of the Raga. And so I've heard the phrase of Pakad or of Bandish, and I was wondering if it was one of those you were referring to. Uh, it, yes, definitely. It's the Pakad. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, the heart of the Raga is the Pakad. And okay. it's, it's something you hear repeatedly. Okay. But the Bandish is more like um, the, the wording for, uh, for a vocal um, uh, Raga. Oh. Okay. The, you, they talk about the, uh, the Bandish. Uh, okay. For for a raga, but usually the bandish will contain the pakad. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Our next question is um, I, I want to say Gabriel Lee or Gabriel Lee. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, I'm here. <laughs> so listening, Steve, to you play the instrument it sounded like um, some Japanese instruments that i've heard is there anything that's similar to the indian instrument that's in japan well not really um but the music that i was playing um the pentatonic scale one of them that i was playing might be considered to be japanese as well um I'd like to think so, actually, when you, when you put it that way. Um, but as far as an actual instrument that looks like this, um, I guess, I'm more talking about the sound of it, not the instrument. Ah, the sound. Um, yeah, you know, like that's a good the question. Shami, the shamisen has, is fretless. It's you know, but and it doesn't have the sustain because they don't the do resonance. the fingernail thing. Yeah, the yeah. 
but it has a, a pluck and the ability to have a fretless note slide happen. So there's some similarity there, and it's played with a pick. Okay. Plectrum. I don't know. The Biwa, I don't know how you know similar. That has some frets, though, doesn't it? Biwa has frets, yeah. It has some frets, yeah. Koto, Koto um, has the ability to make large slides. Um, so that could be um, very similar to the Sarod in terms of the sound. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Koto was one of the instruments that I, I was, my parents wanted me to play Koto. Really? <laughs> oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, not not the Sarod. Say, so what do you want? What do you want an in Indian instrument? You should have a Japanese instrument. <laughs> wow. Well, you're able to 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 bring that sound into it somehow. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And yeah, we had one other more of a comment that I'll just read, but somebody mentioned there's an iPhone app called Radio Garden that has uh, music from India that you can listen to all day long. And they said it's terrific to listen to. Oh, Radio Garden. Uh, the um, and, and just so people know, if you look in your chat along the way, uh, we did provide a lot of the materials, the links to both of these gentlemen's websites, and there's a lot of great information on both uh, about this music, and just wanted you to know that. And um, Thanks, Scott. we've got um, another person, Ginny. Let's see, Ginny Huntington, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Ginny. Okay. There you go. I'm just wondering if the rules and traditions um, that you discussed are different in North and South India, or if there's some regional uh, interpretation. Um, it's such a big area, it's hard to imagine that everybody would go by the same rules, but um, I, I, this is fascinating. Um, I live in Iowa. If you're ever coming this way, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, thank you. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer a little bit of that. Yes, very definitely there are, are large differences between the north of India, uh, as they call it, Hindustan, versus the south of India, the Carnatic. Um, they may have the similar scales, but much, much, much different way of interpreting each raga. Um, so it, it's a very good question because they are two distinctive, distinctly different and um, very deep traditions um, that sometimes share similar scales and similar names. Um, apart from that, um, I don't know. I don't know too much about the Carnatic scale of, uh, of music. Ty, do you know anything? Not about the scales, <laughs> uh, but the, um, it's an interesting thing in the rhythmic instruments that mm. the predecessor of the tabla was pakawaj and that was a two-ended barrel drum like a single piece of wood with a low dr uh, low side and a high side and um the equivalent in south india is a murdangam and that is very similar to that in that it's a single piece of wood low and high end and uh, the low end in particular has a, a, a uh, the, the old style, not the, the black dot, which is permanent on the tabla, semi-permanent. Um, it, it's a piece of dough or a certain type of uh, paste that they make to put on there. And that's how it was for the predecessor of the tabla. And, but if you look at the playing technique of the pakawage, which is the direct relative descendant or, or ancestor of the tabla, and then the playing technique of Murdungam, actually the tabla technique is more similar to Murdungam, South Indian, in terms of how they accomplish the different strokes than the North Indian ancestor, the Pakawaj. Mm. And yet the repertoire, the vocal uh, composition from the Pakawaj is what we inherit onto the tabla, a great deal of it. So it's a very interesting topic, just the differences and the similarities there. 
So there's the rhythmic end. All right. Our next question comes from Saul Grossman. Saul, if you'd like to, Saul, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Uh, is, is there a way to differentiate contemporary Indian music from the classical uh, forms? In, by contemporary, Saul, do you mean um, like Bollywood type music or? Uh, I'm, I'm not as familiar with more modern uh, Indian music, I guess. More, more modern. Um, yeah. Well, um, all of the music, I think, or at least most of the, the good music I've heard, um, of the modern, modern days of music is all based on the classical tradition. It might be slightly altered to fit different rhythms or different uh, formats of the music, but uh, it, it ultimately uses as its fundamental the uh, ancient classical uh, Indian music scales and, and, and um, rules. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. In the uh, certainly a lot of people are familiar with Bollywood music these days, and I think it it uh, must borrow from elements of the classical Indian. Although there's a lot of synthesizer and different elements to it, but mm. um, yeah, the instrument instrumentation may change, um, and and certainly be more predominantly Western uh, keyed instruments like mm. synthesizers or pianos or or guitars, but but ultimately they try to follow the, the the ancient raga tradition as much as they as they as they can. And then we have a question from Youssef. If Youssef, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, my, my question was about, you know, how the different um, styles of playing uh, classical is, uh, the pure classical is a different style of playing. And then when you accompany a light classical or a ghazal, like uh, Mehdi Hassan Khan and Ghulam Ali Khan Saab, they sing all these ghazals and their accompaniment is kind of entirely different as opposed to the classical instrumental or vocal, because now it has to accompany with the words and the and the and the poetry that goes along with that. So I was wondering, is how do you uh, deal with that? If if you ever accompany those um, kind of singing, hmm. have you done that, Steve? Have you accompanied? Uh, no, Gazelle? no, um, no. I have not. I, I I think he's referring to the tabla accompaniment. That's right. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I a little bit. Um, you know, there's, I used to listen to like Ghulam Ali who was one of my favorites and Midi Hussain and, um, and a lot of what, um, I, like my Guruji Zakir, uh, played with a, a great album with, um, um, Hari Haran. I don't yes. know if you know those two. Yes, I'm aware. Yeah. yeah, very, very nice. And so I, I was able to hear, it was almost like a bridge he created where he was playing certain Rela or certain forms that I know from classical. And they, they, they worked so beautifully, kind of, you know, peeking out or sometimes developing a little bit, but in that musical setting. And the grooves um, that are played there are, they're different. You know, a lot of them have a swing to them, which you won't find in the classical so much. Um, and... Uh, it's more akin to me to uh, Western, you know, folk music. Um, the the groove is sh uh, shorter in length. It's more about the feel of the groove, and um, mm. and, and so 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 for me, I don't do enough of that to really be any kind of voice <laughs> for for it. But I do love it, and I listen to it a lot. And I, I play, you know, some kirtan sometimes, uh, and I have played a little bit of guzzle, um, and I'm just using, you know, um, or kovali, you know, a little bit of kovali. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 my focus because I have a limited amount of time, and I started when I was like 30 <laughs> playing Absolutely. the instrument. Um, 
I I would love to actually have developed that a, a significantly more than I have. I can do it, but I'm not at, at all. And and the other element, like you mentioned, is understanding what the poetry is influences correct. what you play, right? That's correct. Yes. The the breaks and everything. So mm -hmm. uh, not speaking the language or speaking very little of it is you know makes it a a bigger hurdle to jump over. Mm. That's I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Mm. Do you, do you play? I I sing a little bit of ghazal. Mm. Yes. My my Beautiful. my favorite is Mehdi Hasan Khan Sahab and Ghulam Ali Khan Sahab and of course I also mm. try to uh, attempt to sing Hariyal and I know it's way I have heard his entire album of Hazir which yeah. is an amazing tabla accompaniment from Zakir Hussain ji and um, even though he is not <laughs> a light uh, he doesn't accompany light musicians um, or ghazal singing but this was a unique um, uh, album mm -hmm. that I really really enjoyed and yeah and Tarikha is of course is my favorite in as far as mm -hmm. ghazal accompaniment Tarikha yeah. sahab is is yeah. my yeah. idol yeah right yeah beautiful amazing, amazing. Yeah, so this is a little, uh, you know, uh, deeper information than a lot of people are able to follow. But but he's talking about some amazing musicians, singers in the tradition of uh, the the kind of a devotional poetry, right? Put into musical form, you know. Well, we have somebody kind of interested in. I guess wanted to make a comment that some they wanted to hear you guys play. And again, with them being together on Zoom, there's a delay issue, so they can't actually play at the same time. Um, mm. And so uh, you'll have to come to the concert. And if you can't come to the concert, uh, definitely search out their music. And uh, I think uh, Ty's website link has has links to the music and recordings available. And uh, Steve, I, do you, I assume you have it as well. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. One thing and, we could and, do. and I'd also say too, if for those of you participating from afar, um, if you're interested in Steve and Ty coming to play in your community, you can reach out to them through their website links as well, because I, I'm sure they'd welcome, um, you know, again, sharing this beautiful music across the country some more. Thank you, Scott. Indeed. Thank um, you. Is there something given that you can't play together? Maybe um, there's a little something each one of you could play us out on. We have about three minutes left today, or four minutes. And I was there... say, I could I could just do a little like an intro as if I was going to keep playing. You know, they, they call it the mukra uh, or the face of of uh, the introduction, as as when I would come in, and then. I can just then hand it over to Steve and he could play something that I would otherwise play with, <laughs> but I won't today. <laughs> so I just, I just do a little, uh, brief. I don't think that my tuning is going to match his, but, um, uh, I'll just play a little bit. Let me change the tuning. I think this one's up at D. So this is a low drum I have here. This one's a higher drum. But one of the traditional ways to come in, if Steve's been developing his rag, painting out more and more uh, color and more and more shape, at some point he'll invite me to come in, and I'll usually come in with a little bit of a, a solo, and then I'll go into the road making of uh, the teka or the, the rhythm cycle. So I might do something like a peshkar. So... Uh, I'll just come in. take it up and I would play a little <laughs> faster. Mm -hmm. 
I wish we could play together. Well, we will yeah, be. be <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Get the juices flowing there. Well, I, I really want to thank you both so much for doing this webinar today. We've had great kudos coming in through the chat that we'll share with you too afterward. And uh, want to thank everybody for joining us uh, remotely today. And uh, again, the recording will be available uh, after uh, in, a, in a couple of days. We'll notify everybody for you can revisit this. And again, I encourage you to very much come and enjoy them in person when they're here in Tucson or in Green Valley. And uh, I, again, just want to thank you both so much. And we're looking forward to hosting you next month. Uh, I can't wait. Thank, thank you, you so Scott. much, Scott. Looking forward. All right. Yeah. Thank you all so much. And oh, somebody's saying only three tickets are left. Better. Oh, oh my gosh. There's, they're selling fast. So um, thank you all again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, speaker series webinar on February 20th. But otherwise, we'll see you at the show. And for our members who may be um, interested in, in attending the show, we are also going to be doing a dining out event prior to the event, uh, a local Indian restaurant. So you can find that on our website. Oh. And uh, Nice. We also have other programming about India and the like um, this spring at our Central Tucson campus. So um, again, it, we tried to round out the whole whole thing, but uh, very Thank much you, looking Scott. forward to having both of you back here in Tucson. And uh, again, thank you so much. And we'll be Namaste. In touch very soon. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you very much. Everyone, take care and have a great week out there. Bye bye.